Oh, my God. All right, yes. I don't want to lose you, man. It took forever to get you. <laughs> nah, that's all good. How's family? Everybody's good. I'm good. How, how, how's your family doing? Good, man. I'm good. Hold on. Let me let me grab the, the kofi, man. Let me get the, the <laughs> official. <clears throat> you know, I had a baby girl, man, so been busy. Yeah. Yeah, congratulations. With the kids. So. I'm the love, man. I think this is good. You look good, mashallah, man. You look like you haven't aged, man. Yeah, I'm not aging. I got a little gray, though, you know. Hey, there you go. Can't, can't do nothing about that, man. Um, let's say hypothetical thing, but I know this uh, happens with a lot of people. So a sister is married to, um, they're Christian, right? So sister's married to a husband. They're both Christian, and she decides to uh, take a shahada and become a Muslim. Right. How does the process go? What advice would you give her once she becomes a Muslim and the husband doesn't want to become Muslim? Um, how long is, you know, before the marriage is actually dissolved? And how, how, how do they actually go about that in this country, yeah. you know, in a situation that way? Yeah, so we know, like, these kind of issues always, when I was in uh, the College of Islamic Law, they used to say on the exam, if you don't know the answer, just say there's two opinions. <laughs> 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 like, you always pass, right? So we know, we know, like, this issue has two opinions. Uh, Imam Ibn Qayyim, one of the great classic uh, scholars and, and others, more recently, Sheikh Yusuf Qaradawi and others. And I saw this from my own teacher, Sheikh Ahmed India from Senegal. Well, like, you know, the age of the individual is a new age, right? 200 years ago, even less than that for many, like my mother's family, they were from the country. You still live together with a big family. So if, God forbid, there was a divorce or something, you would have a support system. A woman in particular would have a support system that she could fall into with her and her children even. Now, nowadays, we live in the age of the individual where most of us are even separated from our family. We don't have that supporting, that support net. COVID exposed that, by the way. Yeah. People got caught up, couldn't make it home, couldn't fly back to their families, couldn't, couldn't hunker down in the zombie apocalypse. You know what I mean? And it became, it became hard for them. So Sheikh Ahmed, I remember in Oklahoma, there was a, there was a number of women who embraced al-Islam who their husbands when I'm Muslim, and he said, give them time. And I asked him, like, how much time? And he said, first of all, they need to discuss that amongst themselves. Mm -hmm. Allah says, even about breastfeeding, that the spouses, to share like they talk about it. Mm -hmm. And then they lay out a strategy, and she just has to nicely, as best she can, it's not an easy conversation, and yeah. say, listen, like, maybe you can take, like, one of the Welcome to Islam courses at the masjid, go through the whole course, be properly exposed, and after, say, six months to a year, we can sit down and have this conversation again. Because even for her to tell her to suddenly, and her children, if there's kids involved, to suddenly uproot the family, it's going to have a lot of impact on people. And Islam looks after benefits and harms. Yeah. What's called al-masarih wa mafasid. We know there's other ulama, respect the scholars, said that she has to leave immediately. But that's that's... That's not for me. That's not taken into the cultural context. And then again, we're not in the age of the individual. We're in the, uh, we're in, we are in the age of the individual. Excuse me. So, so you know, I think it's a decision that they need to talk about. The community needs to support her to help her not say run off with the you know run off and leave the guy because alhamdulillah, if he embraces al Islam, mashallah, man, then it's a win win. Yeah. You know what I mean. Now, but now, so what if it's a case where the brother absolutely does not want to become a Muslim at all, and then now it's a hardship on her, and and, and especially let 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 let's say the sister she's new to the community, she don't really have community, you know what I mean? Like she doesn't, right. you know, it's like so like what kind of because I this this happens a lot. I hear about this in a barbershop all the time, and right. so how 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 long legally? Does, does does the marriage still exist before you know and and, and during that time where they're still cohabitating does the, does the husband still have rights to her sexually and all that or does she have the right to refuse or 
Like how does well, that so, work? So, so, you know, the Islamic idea of marriage is not even going to come into play. He's not Muslim, right? Mm -hmm. But she has the right to say, there's no, you know, there's no, there's no physical relationship, man, you know, because of this reason, right? Mm -hmm. For me, I think ultimately we just need to say our sisters, do what you got to do. Because ain't nobody going to support them financially, Achi. Yeah. nobody's going to be there. And then if there's a bunch of brothers trying to marry them really quickly, that's never a good sign either. Yeah. Yeah. So my, my advice is you make that call because nobody knows her needs and her children's needs better than she does. Yeah. And this is my problem with the online fatwa stuff. Oh, sister, you got to leave that brother immediately. Stuff for a lot of the, and then that sister is in a home. I've seen this in New York sisters in the homeless shelters. Where were the brothers that were on the hack? And the sisters that were on the hack, uh -huh. then give us some of them dead presidents, man. <laughs> you know, everybody wants to sac wants people to sacrifice for their answer, but nobody wants to sacrifice for the people they're answering to. Yeah. So my yeah. thing is, she doesn't. It's like it's like some of the scholars said. Like if you got a haram job and you and you can't find any other job, then you keep that job until you find a job that's going to sustain you. Yeah. So here, I would tell the sister, even, even the cohibition stuff, look, until you're stable, until you got it, where you feel safe for you and your kids, because the community is not going to help her. Ahi. We have to be honest. Yeah. They're yeah. going to preach to her, but they're not going to support her. Yeah. Then she is going to have to find, when she feels most comfortable, I'm safe, my children are safe, because man, that stuff can ha have a massive impact on the kids. And you know what can happen, Ahi? I've seen this. If she bolts, right? She bolts. Let's say she dips. I hope your audience understands like how you and I are talking. I didn't get it. If she breaks out, right? She breaks. Uh -huh. And then he takes her to court and says that she's not capable of taking care of her children. Who you think the court going to give the kids to? Yep. So not only did, did we, we lose the husband who could have maybe Allah put the light of Islam in his heart. Now we lost her kids. Okay. So the faqih, the faqih is the one who understands, right? The faqih is not the one who just gives answers, but the faqih is the one that tries to look into the entire situation. So my advice, you know, it's like the answer that the imam gives you, and he's like, come here, come here, come here. He whispers it to you, he doesn't want to put it on, is to tell the sisters, nobody <laughs> can negotiate this situation better than you. And if you are not safe and financially stable, Allah is Rahim, man. Yeah, Allah is Rahim. And the communities, it, it, and again, people who want to preach and tell her what she needs, okay, then give her three years' salary or a year's salary to make that move. Yeah. You're going to get crickets. Exactly. Right? So my advice is, first of all, ain't really none of our business. Mm -hmm. What people do in their houses, what they do in their houses. But if she asks, my advice has usually been, because this is a very sensitive issue, man, is you navigate this in a way that you feel is best and we will support you through that process. And eventually there may come a point in time where you have to make a decision to end your marriage, but let's not rush to end this marriage. Mm -hmm. Right? Let's try to navigate it so that alhamdulillah, the people, because we have an axiom in Islamic law that where there's weakness, there's no obligation. This is one of the foundations of Sharia. al mushaqqa tajibu taysir. And, and also, when we take answers from people that have never really lived this, they may theoretically have an idea, but like you and I have seen how this stuff can hurt people, man. Yeah. So the, the faqih is not simply just throwing out answers, man. Right, the faqih is trying to help people navigate. Well, that, that, that's why I tell people all the time is um, we 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 have a, a problem. I, I say in in our time where we we always want to talk about what things are supposed to be instead of dealing with what things are, and it doesn't mean that like I don't think that we should, you know, we don't ever excuse like we know what the fig rulings are, we know, you know. What, what we're supposed to do, but when we have a, 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 we have a real crisis and this is what actually is and how do we deal with this? So like another, another thing that's been coming up, uh, women. And, and, and hold on, 
And mm -hmm. fiqh is governed by axioms and rules and principles. Mm -hmm. the, it, it, you know, like I said, I gave a major axiom there. We learned this when we were training to be muftis in Egypt. Where there's weakness, where there's weakness, there's dispensation. When there's like legitimate weakness, right? And this is a legitimate fear that financially, uh, sister inshallah, Allah will take care of you. I know Allah will take care of me, but I need you to take care of me. Yeah. Allah commanded you to take care of me, right? So if we're really serious about this, why don't we create funds in all the masjids where we put each of us put like 15, 20, 30 in it, cancel Comcast, quit playing Call of Duty Warzone, cancel all that, pull off on the Jordans and the sneakers, let's all put money in a fund that's going to support women who convert to Islam who are married to non-Muslims. Nobody will do it, man. No, nobody. But everybody will have an answer. And we don't that's have funds to do it either. I mean, this is another thing that I, I talk about um, not only just in my own local community, but um, with, with a lot of imams, like I don't, I don't, I see other communities that know how to get money, but particularly, especially in the black community, I'm being real specific. It seems like our institutions don't know how to to do business as a master either, and so that in order to have funds for that, we need to learn how to invest the actual money in order for there to be money there because just relying on platter sales and donations usually doesn't even cover the light bill you know so white converts white converts is the same thing like i told a brother show me show me one masjid in america that's founded by people who've accepted islam that are paying salaries to people but they always want to complain I'm talking about my folks right they mm -hmm. always want to complain but like Jay Z said, either you own or being owned. Like it's not, it's this is not rocket science. If we're not willing to, like, if 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 I'm motivated by you, right, I'll support you. You know what I mean? Like if I'm inspired and I see that you have vision and that you're taking me somewhere, I'm gonna put even you know people will come to the Prophet so and gave their children to the Prophet. Mm -hmm. Um Sulaim said, I could find nothing to give you. I'm giving you my son. And it's diplomatic. Like she's inspired, right? So in general, we're not scale, we're not scaffolding, right? And and we're not we're not creating structures and layers of really what community is. Yeah. It's a very theoretical thing, but it's not it's not like in a way that's like layered that takes into consideration the needs of people, you know. And and and, and like you said, you said something very profound, right? Very rarely do people act the way people should <laughs> mm -hmm. so it's like you have you and i have to think strategically about how do we protect that and that's not there at least i'll say amongst you know like white converts nah man <laughs> nah, so so what, what, another thing has been coming up a lot we find a lot of sisters and you know, I, I don't always want to make this about marriage, but these are always the questions that come up. Um, a lot of sisters who are available and they're looking for brothers to marry. Of course they have specific things that they want and don't want. And because they can't find good options, this has been the question all the time is why can't I just marry a Christian brother? Or, or a Jewish brother the same way that the, the, the brothers can. And I always tell them, I say, you know, there's stipulations on that as well. But this is something that a lot of times we get questions from sisters and they say, well, how come you can do it and we can't? That, do you think that's fair? Or, you know, or how about if I just find a brother that's of another faith and I convert them the same way you guys do? You know, like, what, what do you say to those, those sisters? I mean, first of all, whatever Allah has legislated is, is the epitome of justice and fairness, right? Exactly. But if we, look, if we look historically, we have precedent where Muslim leaders or even ulama said it's no longer allowed for men to marry non-Muslim women. For example, in the time of Sayyidina Umar, Umar ibn Khattab, he said, man, y'all can't marry these non-Muslim women no more because it's becoming a fitna for the Muslim woman. Uh -huh. This is, is well-established. Right. The, the problem with the American Muslim community in general is that we don't have a depth of knowledge of Islamic law to be able to understand that there's a depth and a, and a maturity there. 
Yep. So if, if I said that was my opinion, I guarantee someone, oh, that's Bira, brother. You're changing the religion. But if I said that was Omar and you just attacked Omar, now who's the one falling into Bida? Mm -hmm. Right? And, 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 and that's one thing. The challenge, I would say, in, in the American Muslim community is like a culture of knowledge where we respect, even if we don't agree with one another, we're able to differ in a way that's like, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily vibe with you, Akhi, but I still love you, you know, alhamdulillah. Like Ali and Omar, they, they, they did not agree on a lot of things, but they still loved each other. So Sayyidina Omar in his, as Ibn Qayyim mentions in Alam, he suspended Muslim men marrying non-Muslim women because it was a trial for Muslim women. In India, in India, in Fatwa al-Hindiya, I believe, the scholars there said that Muslim women can no longer marry Muslim women because they are losing their deen. In southern Italy, where the Muslims were there for 400 years or so, not in Spain, in Italy. In Italy, the Muslims lost because of opulence, man, not because of pain. They were living a good, they were chilling. They chilled so hard they thawed out, like they lost their deen. And, and, one of the reasons that they lost their deen was they were marrying non-Muslim women. In fact, it was a strategy for them to marry non-Muslim women so you would mix the family. So me personally, Akhi, I don't marry brothers to non-Muslim sisters for the most part. Mm -hmm. Because we, as you said, there is an abundance of Muslim women out there. And, you know, you got to, I, I haven't seen it work very much, Akhi. Like, I'll be honest, when I see brothers marry, non-Muslim women. And it's not, I'm not just blaming the non-Muslim woman. Yeah. It's just like, it's like Linux and Windows. It's like clippers and scissors. Mm -hmm. Like a straight razor and bit, you know, you the barber, <laughs> right? It just doesn't, it's like magic shave and, and shaving cream, right? It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't work, right? So I personally, I don't do it. And I'm, in fact, on the, I'm on the Fit Council of North America. This is one of the discussions I want to bring up. It's like we, we should, you know, strongly, strongly address this issue. Because, man, you see great, great Muslim women, you know, that are like in their 40s and 50s and never found a husband. And that's tough, man. They say that loneliness is one of the leading causes of death in America. Yeah, yeah. You know, so like. Oh, well, brother, she can get a, she can become a second wife. Man, she doesn't want to become a second wife. That's her culture. Her culture is different. Be, having a second wife, according to the Malikis, is not even sunnah. It's just permissible. Mm -hmm. It's not even considered sunnah in the Maliki school. It's considered mubah. Then read what the Hanabila, the Hanbalis, Hanbalis, man, they have a lot of discussion about how, you know, I'm not, I'm not telling anybody how to live their life, of course. Mm -hmm. That's their personal choice. But we need to go also and see what our tradition says on certain, like it, it, if it hurts people, if it brings problems to the relationship, mm -hmm. like all those situations. Mm -hmm. Sister doesn't want to really opt into that, right? So, you know, we, we got work to do, man. <laughs> we got some heavy lifting. <laughs> I, I, I'll be very transparent. Like, I, um, you know, I, I, I was in polygyny um, in the past and you know, I, I I have I have different opinions of it. You know, what I mean, um, I mean, of course, I, I don't like disagree with it, but I understand some of the fitness that it can cause just from watching a lot of the stuff that I went through personally. You know, I, it's mm -hmm. not really something that um I'm necessarily that interested in anymore. You know, what I mean, because of a lot of the stuff that I went through, but at the same time especially when I see right in the, in the community, it's kind of like a, it's a real touchy subject because what we're doing anyway, people are just, they just cutting up anyway. You know what I'm saying? So then it's like, how do you, how do you actually fix that issue? Because the intention for most people is, all right, I have this, instead of me doing something around, let's make this permissible and do it this way. Absolutely. But, Absolutely. But then what happens, we do it this way, and then the expectations, they go through the roof. And then a whole bunch of other nonsense happens. So then a lot of brothers, especially in the barbershop, they come and they say, yo, you know what? I ain't getting married no more. <laughs> like, I ain't getting married. I'm not doing... Right. I've seen that. I've seen it most women and men. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because where's the middle ground with that, especially when we don't have... 
we don't have, I mean, we have a, a North American Fit Council, but nah, they ain't going choose, on. you know, what they want to listen to or not listen to, you know? So this is like a self-governed thing, you know? I, absolutely. And I think that, that that's the answer, right? First of all, what people choose to do in their personal lives is their business. Mm -hmm. We don't need to be censoring people if they choose to live a polygynous relationship. That's their business, mm -hmm. right? And and again, a, a lot of scholars say it's sunnah. Right? I'm, I'm just giving you the Maliki school opinion. Mm -hmm. And we don't need to be like putting people on blast because it actually hurts their children. Like I've seen polygynous families where people make fun of them, stuff for Allah. Right, people tease them, people ostracize them, and these people are so heartless and so harsh. They don't realize it's, it's having a very negative impact on the children who are already sometimes trying to make sense of why am I in a two-parent or three-parent, four-parent situation? Mm -hmm. Like that's just wrong, man. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you're hurting the family and you're hurting the children. Second thing is, like I said, we need people to have enough information that they can make their own decisions. Like, you don't have to come to the mosque to be authorized by anybody as, a, as, as adults. We're talking about grown folks, not like, you know, not the young chickens, man. We're talking about, you know, the older folks to make decisions for their lives. Yeah. The, the people didn't come to the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu and ask him things like this. They asked him about feeding orphans. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I, I think, and then I, I think there's going to come a point in time with the way marriage is shaping out in America now that there's going to have to be support services for people like therapy, family therapy, right? That takes into consideration different models of the family. Um, and and, and it, it, this one is, 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 is hard, man, because marriage ain't easy, you know that. Yeah. Right? It's a beautiful thing, it's wonderful, but you know, we, we all have our ups and downs in marriage. And and I just don't like the idea of, like, putting people on blast. Like, if a sister says, I don't want to be in a polygynous relationship, that's her business. Like, we don't need to put pressure on her or put or a brother. Like, nah, achi, I'm just happy with my wife. Alhamdulillah, I'm good. You know, and then, uh, you know, then he, he starts to me feel as though he's not fulfilling his Islam. He's married. Yeah. And then you said there are people, let's be honest, they come to the masjid, and they're like, I'm in a haram relationship. I want to make it halal. Okay, make it halal. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, like those, are the, those are the realities of it. <laughs> you know? And, and we need to help people. And, and we can also tell people, like, hey, I don't agree with you maybe doing this, but I, I'm still your brother. Alhamdulillah, I'm still, you know, I'm here, here to help as best I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, 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 it's it's a lot, man. Um, I I know when when I when I became Muslim, I was I, I, I it sounds bad, but <laughs> like I honestly didn't have intentions of being a quote unquote good Muslim, <laughs> you know, because the 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 examples that I had, I didn't know any better. I just thought, you know, Islam was like you know, that's your religion, and then people did what they did, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I, I grew up in in Catholic school. I went to Catholic school most of my life, and I actually uh, learned Islam in Catholic school. SubhanAllah. Sparked my interest, man. Yeah, but, man. Um, yeah, I, I, my, my, my sixth grade teacher, um, she, she, we actually had to learn about the, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi We learned his whole story in, in like, our religion class. And the, the story was very, very similar to Prophet Jesus. And so I was asking, I said, hey, well, what's up with this? It's like almost the same story to me. Like, it, oh, it's not true. Wow. And I said, well, what do you mean? So I, I went and from sixth grade, probably to the time I got out of high school, I just kept studying and studying. And by the time I got out of high school and my girlfriend at the time, she got pregnant. And I decided then I said, you know, I'm not going to raise – my 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 children in in Christianity because I, I I had so many so many issues with it and when I made the decision okay I'm going to be Muslim I, I knew what I wanted for my children I didn't know everything that came with it 
So once I started going to the masjid and started learning, started reading, once I started studying fit, that's when I started holding myself more accountable for, for, you know, what I'm supposed to be doing. But, and, and the reason why I'm telling the story is because I know there's other people that might've went through this is once you learn and then now you got to hold yourself accountable when you're looking at the way the rest of the world is, and it's, it's, it's really hard to, 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 to impose these laws on yourself without having some type of authority over you. Like, you know, the way the Sherry is designed. One of the things that we asked um, my, my partner and I, he's not here now, but um, when we do these conversations, we always ask like different people in the community, like, well, what if we were able to establish our own, like, not like a fit council, but like, just amongst ourselves, kind of like how the Jewish community has in New York, where we had people appointed over us who could, we could take our marriage disputes to or money disputes to, not like a full-blown court system, but someone who can actually just settle that. Why, why, how hard would that be to, well, I know how hard it would be, but do you ever see that realistically, us being able to do that in our own communities? And it was there before, like with the nation, right? Let's be yeah. honest. Yeah. With with uh with the more science temple, um with with you know communities that we don't see as orthodox Muslims mm -hmm. um brought discipline to this. The church, man, a lot of the real, real powerful churches, you know, they have like deacons and elders, and, you know. I get it, you know, the Cadillac with the boomerangs and stuff, but still like they they have people. And then within the community of Imam Jamil and even Imam Debidi Muhammad, right? Mm -hmm. There was a system. Um, and I would say that, that, that different movements came into, especially like American Muslim communities, convert communities, that undermined that leadership. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and when it undermined it intellectually, right? It, either like you're not Sufi enough, you're not Salafi enough, right? That's, th th both of those movements came in and respectfully, right, undermined it inadvertently the leadership of those communities. And what that did is led to a massive decentralization where now that system is gone, right? If you go to like, for example, Imam Siraj in Brooklyn, that system is still there. Yeah. If you go to Imam Tadab Rashid in Harlem, right? In the Masjid of Islamic Brotherhood, that system is there. Masjid Khalifa in, in Brooklyn, that, that system is there. Uh, Masjid, I think, Islam in Atlanta, that system is there. Right, so inadvertently, sometimes in, in, in bringing back the knowledge, which is great, it's important, bring back the knowledge, Echi. bring back the knowledge, Uchti. but not to the point that it undermines the systems that protect the community, right? And that's, I think, I'm saying this to, to remind myself, as young guys, we came back a little too, a little bit too much juice, man, you know, a <laughs> little bit too much juice on the block, yeah. and, and may have inadvertently undone those things right so i think that it could happen but i think first and foremost american muslims need to heal from the the constant back and forth destructive hatred that they have for one another man and i'm talking about like us man you know what i mean like there's so much infighting and division that how can you heal like if you keep hitting the scab it's just keep bleeding right yeah. We know that people on this camp are not going to go to this side. And people on this side, they're not going to go to that. Okay, great. We got that established. Now, what are we going to build for our kids? Yeah. We don't even have a culture of Quran. Look at every other right. Muslim culture in the world. Right. You and I, when you and I were together in Mecca, right? Yeah. We would see people reading the Quran every morning, right? Yeah. And they had like a culture of Quran. We're still arguing about this imam was right, this imam is wrong, how long wear your pants on, your ankles, and, uh, right? We've been arguing about this for 30 years. All the outward stuff. Yeah. All the outward stuff, or do you have a sheikh? Are you in a tariqah? Did you make bay'ah? Look, man, I got three kids, Ahi. Mm -hmm. I'm scared about my, I'm scared. I'm really worried, yeah. right? As a, as a white convert in the Muslim community, I'm worried, right? Because the, 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 the Muslim culture, right? That culture of 
learning Quran. We don't have it like other, other places embraced Islam and embraced it in such a way that they scaled a culture. Yeah. We don't have a culture. No, we don't have any culture. And, and that, yeah, and so people, and what I mean by culture is not like Hot 97 or whatever, you know what I'm saying? What I mean is, 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 is like a certain, like, like you go to Malaysia every Thursday night, you can find people reading the Quran in the masjid. You go to Egypt, while in Egypt, every morning, every morning, even the policemen, it's the weirdest thing I've ever seen in the world. God conducting traffic, man, reading the Quran. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was like, well, I was like they, they, and I remember me and Imam Amin, we talked about this before, where we have that in Christianity, though, because we, we, you can have in, 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 in America, doesn't matter what you were doing all week. This is how my family grew up. You can hit the club. You can been drinking. You can do everything you're doing all week long. But come Sunday, you go to the, to the, to the church and you pay your tithes no matter what. And once we get that type of culture in Islam, you know, are right, we reading the Quran? We have a Quran school. We pay the sadaqa. We hit the zakat. Like that. That's what you mean by culture, right? <laughs> yeah, and that was there before. That was actually there. Yeah. And and again, I, you know, look at the community of in in. I can't speak on behalf of that community because they have their own leadership and great people. But if you look at the community of the Imam, Nabi Muhammad, right? They have a culture. Yeah. They had declared Muhammad schools, right? They had they had things that were growing. If we look at even the community of Imam Jamil. Right, and even under the leadership of Imam Siraj 20, 30 years ago, nationwide, right, there was a culture that was created. With, with the Dar Islam movement, I became Muslim through a person from the Dar, right? They were out selling incense and oils. There was so when you, when you became when I became Muslim, I gave they gave me a bag of Somali rose, Egyptian musk, and for those and some some blue love, I forgot what it's called blue love or whatever the incense. He was like, Look, brother, you gotta have a hustle, or you're gonna fall into haram. What what year so, was it? 92. So when, when I came in, there was a culture for like, you, you come into the community, now you have to do things that protect you from doing things that you used to do. So there's a, there's a, there's a culture, right? One of my brothers said, I went, that we converted together. He said, I went from selling dime bags to selling dime bags. You know what I mean? I was selling dime bags of weed, but now I'm selling dime bags of incense and oil, you know? He's like, I just put different stuff in the bag. It's like a beautiful thing for him. Yeah. But he was like, I'm still hustling, but now I'm, I'm hustling. Like now I learned to earn because I'm righteous, right? Yeah. Now, now I moved on to, to like righteousness. If we're not careful, man, and, and some of this stuff was put into our community by overseas agents, Ahi. we have to be real about it. And the CIA and the Mossad and Islamophobes. And, and we got played, man. Like we, we got played to the point, man, Allah guided you and me in this place to the deen. Like a brother told me, he went from the mem the the, uh, the bar to the member, and and like that doesn't compel us to work together. The love of this light that Allah put on our hearts to excuse some of the the secondary issues that we may have. We could talk about it. We could talk about it in the alley. We don't talk about it on stage in front of the crowd. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But we want to talk in front of the crowd. Whereas as men and as women, we know that there's a way that we, we talk if we have problems. Yeah. And, and that's a way that maintains, like they, I, heard, I read a beautiful story one time about uh, Malik Shabazz or Himwala, that when he was in, uh, I think in Alabama, he was going on like Dr. King, right, on stage. Mm -hmm. And Dr. King's wife uh, was there, the late uh, uh, Mrs. King. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, Malcolm came to her and he said, tell your husband, thank you. And then she realized what he was trying to do was distract the enemy and make them think that they had beef. Yeah. We don't even think like this, man. Someone comes to us and be like, man, I heard uh, Imam uh, Amin, right? Imam Amin. Mm -hmm. I heard he, Imam Amin, like, he's wrong. I'll be like, oh, yeah, he's wrong. I don't even know him. Yeah. I don't even know him, man. Like, we yeah. fall into it instead of saying, why is he wrong? You know what I mean? Like, we're, we're already pre preconditioned to hate each other, but Allah put this light in us, man. Look where he took us from, bro. Yeah, you're right. Allah, boy, like that love for that. If we really love Islam, then that love should carry us to work together and work through our differences and build everything that you're talking about right now, women, marriage, kids. That, need, that, needs, that needs layers of community, man. Yeah. 
You know what I mean? Like that's that's not the spray that you put on someone trying to hide the ball spot, man. This is this is like this is real, man. This is that that Billy D hair, man. You know that's that thick joint, man. It's not it's not gonna work if it's like fake. And that's why for many of us, and you can tell me this, some of our closest brothers are those we converted with. Like in Oklahoma, we were a group of bloods, Zachi. We all went to the same high school in different neighborhoods. And like 20 of us converted together. Some of them are in jail. Some of them are dead, you know, because, hey, <laughs> the dunya, the dunya, the dunya don't play. Yeah. But to this day, if I need real advice, oh, I know where to go. You know where to go. Because those brothers would die for me before I was Muslim and die for me and I, the same with me. Mm-hmm. Amongst Muslims in general, I don't know who I have a relationship like that with. Man. Yeah. Because those brothers, we knew when we convert, we were young, man. Like the brothers said, I went from dime bags to dime bags, right? We knew that we need each other to survive. Yeah. And that's why they say the prophet, hey, that's why they say the prophet was put in the desert as a child to yeah. teach him you need each other to survive. Yeah. And I, I'm I'm guilty of that. I, I learned the hard way because when I when I first came into Islam, I was all happy and, and exuberant. And then somewhere in the middle, we got into the Salafi wars. And all we like once once I learned fiqh, I was so happy to learn Maliki Fig, learn Akita, Ashari Creed. And then I spent like, me and my friends, we look back maybe five years just arguing and debating Salafis. And then when I look back on it, you know, it didn't really do much. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I, I fought to defend the creed, but when I look, we still got the same problem. You know what I mean? And I still have to exist with these brothers and these sisters. And so... Now my approach is a lot different. So like now, when even with with doing these videos and stuff, you know, people come on and you know, now I might direct something, I might answer something uh, directly if I have to. But most of the times, I let this stuff go because in in a in a, in a community, we got to learn how to coexist, you know. And once I look, I'm like, I didn't learn Islam in order to divide from people. You know what I mean? Even even with even I might not agree, you know, I. I have to be understanding that, you know, you might not have learned what I learned. You know what I mean? You and 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 I might not have learned what you learned. So it, with time, things changes. You know. So. And, you know, one time I was in uh, Azhar, man, in Egypt, and there was a big, you know, Sufi Sheikh. He's an Ashari. He's like a Don, the Ashari, you know, school. Mm-hmm. And so he he saw me. You know, he had the suit on. You know, the Egyptians, man, suit, man. He's looking smooth, man. He had the duke. He had a duke cut back in the days, and he said to me like, "Hey, man." Uh, he said, yeah, tell me about what's going on in America. What are y'all building? Mother assessed them. What y'all build over there? I said, no, no, Sheikh, we're still trying to find what's right. He said, what? I said, yeah, you know, we got Jamaat al-Salafiyya, alhamdulillah, we got the Jamaat al-Asha'ira. He was like, he said, we exported that fitna to you. That's what you took from us? He said, we, akhadna minkum Baywatch. He said, we took from you Baywatch. We akhadna minna, and you took from us, hadi hi al fitna. This fitna. He said, so let me guess. Antum ma asastum shaitan. Y'all ain't built, a, excuse my language, man. Y'all ain't built a thing. I said, yep, shit. He said, la hawla wa he said, man, Allah blessed you brothers with Islam in the wild animal kingdom of the West, man. Yeah. And that hasn't, that, the miracle of yourself, the miracle of you, you coming from what you came from hasn't inspired you to build that light? Man, he was upset, man. I got, a, I got the whole... <laughs> I said, Sheikh, I just, I just, I said, look, Sheikh, I just told you what's going on, Sheikh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but he said, like, we akhadna min kum baywatch wa akhadtu minna hadihi al fitan. <laughs> yeah, me said, baywatch, baywatch. <laughs> so that's, I think that's where, and unfortunately, the way that people usually learn out of this is it's too late. Man. You know, they got kids, grandkids, their kids starting to lose it. 
you know, the kids in trouble, kids in the streets. Because look, if Jahiliya has a community and the Haq doesn't have a community, it's, it's hard. Yeah. Right? If falsehood has a community, even if it's fake, and we don't have a community, and now, man, you think about it, it's like when you got kids, babies, it's like micro community. They got the phone community. They got the community on the video game. They got the community. So it's like little, little, like it's almost like the movie, the TV show, The Expanse, right? It's like little communities. And we don't even have one. Yep. <coughs> yep. You know what I mean? And then we expect them to like, these youngsters to be able to survive it, man. Yo, know, they're dealing with uh, Dua Lipa and Selena Gomez, man, and the Jonas Brothers. Mm -hmm. You know, and we're dealing with, but the Imam said. Yep. Wasting time, man. Yeah. One, one more thing before you go. I know you got to go. <clears throat> um, I didn't, I didn't get to talk to you about this a few years ago, but I, um, I was watching a YouTube video of yours a while ago, and um, you, you used to be a DJ, huh? Perhaps. Perhaps. That, you know, that's where I come from. Yeah, yeah, I used to be a DJ. I used, that's how I found Islam, was in the studio. You know, yeah. I had a friend that was Muslim. I had a friend that was Muslim, but he was kind of like, God bless his soul, man, he got, he got shot and killed when we were very young. But he was Muslim, and his father used to go to the Imam W.D. Muhammad community. And so they were the ones telling me, like, I was like, don't they hate white people, you know? Because I had this one brother, he was, he was in a Fahami like movement, a couple of Nation of Islam. He was a, he was a, he was a singer that I used to work with. Mm -hmm. and, and he was telling me, like, that's why, that's why God gave y'all blue eyes, man, because the sun is going to eat your brains out. <laughs> and you got no estrogen in your skin. You know that, that cat? The cat that, remember those bookstores back in the days, like the Invisible Hand? And so he used to be all in those books, right? So I was like, yo, let me ask this dude like questions. And he was like, you can't be Muslim because you're made from a cat, a rat, and a dog, and Yaqub on an island, and the speed of sound, and the, from the land of Kim. I was like, wow. And he was like, why do you think it called Caucasus Mountains? How can polar bears swing on vines with the gorillas? He was, you know, X Clan and all this stuff, right? And I was like, man, I'm going to hell. <laughs> I was like 16, man. And I was, I remember at night, I was getting butted, man. May Allah forgive me. And I was just like, yo, white people are going to hell. You know what I mean? And then my friend, his father was like, no, 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 no. There's, there's Islam and then there's El Islam. Uh -huh. And I was like, what's El? And he's like, you know, the, like the real. And so he took my friend, Daryl, Dilo, took, took the time to like explain to me. And so in the studio, this one guy used to bring a Quran. And he actually was the producer for that group, Color Me Bad, if you remember Color Me Bad. Oh, yeah. They were from Oklahoma City, right? So they, we were, their manager was my manager. So I started reading the Quran. I was like, oh, this is, this is amazing, man. And that's how like, you know, that's how I kind of started. Alhamdulillah. That's dope, bro. Yeah, I, I yeah. came from the same background, bro. The, the, DJing, uh, that's actually how I became a barber because I got a job. I used to DJ and make mixtapes, do parties. I was uh, producing, but I got a job when I was 14 at the barbershop um, just sweeping the floor so I could have money to buy records and stuff. And then from being at the barbershop, uh, my mentor at the barbershop was Muslim. He's the one who gave me shahada. And then- SubhanAllah. Yeah, it's been a lot. A lot's merciful, man. Yeah, I used to save money to buy them twelve inches, yeah. and then we used to get we used to get the the mixtapes. So like Saturday, Friday night in New York, Red Alert, Morning yeah. Mall, BMX, and then Philly. Philly had the best DJs in the world. They, after, I tell everybody that they they known for their DJs over the rappers. Yeah, Cash Money. Yeah, Jazzy Jeff, Cosmo Kev. Three times dope. Yeah, man, like. You know, nobody, I've never seen anyone DJ live like that, Jazzy Jeff. Jazzy Jeff is the best ever. Live. Yeah. 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 And, then, and then Cash Money, I saw Cash Money, man. He could take the needle and drop it on the point where the record, where he wanted it without any headphones, man. Without, yeah, yeah. That was, yeah. That was crazy. Sorry. And it's some weird ways, like when I memorize the Quran, I'd be like, I can't memorize the Quran. I'd be like, man, you saw a guy. Drop a needle <laughs> on a beat, and you can't You know what I mean? Like it's uh -huh. weird how those things will come back. 
to like motivate you. You know what I mean? Yeah. But you know, alhamdulillah, Allah's merciful, man. Allah's merciful. You still got your twelve hundred techniques, man? What's going on? Yeah, I, I actually do. I got both my twelves. I don't have any of my records. I, I lost a lot of my records in uh in storage. I had a storage unit I didn't pay for. <laughs> but uh, you know, I so I ain't gonna front. Sometimes I miss it. I I, I want to get uh. Like I got Serato on my laptop. I'll be wanting to play, but I don't got time to. You know what I mean? I don't got Babies time. and bills, babies yeah. and bills, man. Babies yeah. and bills. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know it's crazy. I saw, I saw all my records to go learn touch weed, man. That's so why I used the money. This brother, he, this is one guy named to, uh, Tony T. He's like, man, sell me the records, man. You're not using them no more. You, you're Muslim now. Blah blah blah, right? So I said, look, man, give me, give me like two G's. Mm-hmm. And that dude was like, pop, pop, pop. And I said, I'm going to the shack. You know, I was young, man. Dope. Dope. Back then, two G's was like, you, you know, you were like, <laughs> it's a lot of man. And in Oklahoma, you know, you could rent a mansion for like $30. <laughs> so I took it and I went for the summer and like just studied, man. But yeah, it's hard. I still have people in that world contact me sometimes. And, you know, it's interesting, man. Yeah. You know, it's an interesting place. Yeah, I, I don't know the parts of the, 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 the industry stuff. I just used to like the music. I, and to this day, people still ask me to make beats for them and stuff, but I don't... It's, it's like the music is so temporal now. It's like you, you'll hear a new song, you're done with it within two or three listens. Three minutes and 30 seconds. Yeah, I'm not... Three minutes and 30 seconds. making no beat for that. Like, you know what I mean? I, I like... If I was going to make some beats, I want... You the I wanted to live on like you know when you listen to DJ Premier or RZA it's like oh man I know his like now they don't they don't listen to the music long enough so it's it's not even worth it to me you know you know you have someone like like Pete Rock right who will have like thirty or forty samples yep. that are like layered right layered all in so it's not even even like if you listen to reminisce right they reminisce you can hear people in the background ah uh, mm-hmm. uh, so it's like so layered yep. That it can't be three minutes and 30 seconds long. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now it's just like, I don't know, man. I mean, I, you know, it's easier to invoke generational superiority and all that, but I don't really get the the, the vulgarity of today's music. Something I just, I, I don't know, man. I go front. That's what I do like. But <laughs> I actually like some of that stuff. But <laughs> I'm just being honest, man. Hey, 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 stuff a lot, stuff a lot, stuff a lot, bro. Stuff. <laughs> no, I mean, I just, I just, I appreciate the time of like, you know, regardless of the type of music it was, that there was something left for the imagination, yeah. even if it was, even if it was like, you know, The Deal or something or, uh-huh. or Curtis Mayfield or, you know, I think that the explicit, for me, I'm not telling you, me personally, outside of the religious side of it, right, uh-huh. I don't need everything in my face, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, like, yeah, yeah, man. I don't know, man. So, so, so. All right, one more, one more fat talk before you go, right? So, since we're on that conversation, so for the the the, the people in America, the Muslims in America, the Muslims in today's culture, how do you deal with the music is haram fat talk? <laughs> Tell call you, bro. <laughs> Yo, they tell I'm a demon. All right, listen. We're going to do this, man. We'll do another episode. We'll do another episode. Okay, right? cool. We should actually do this in the barbershop because the conversations that we're having are really like... Yeah, I, I need you to come Very men, men-oriented conversations, right? Yeah. You know, a group of men in a room just, you know, chopping it up, man. Nah, uh, so let's, let's... If you can find a barbershop up your way, I'll come up there and do it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, nah, nah, you're not far from me, alhamdulillah. So let's get these vaccines in. Mm-hmm. Did you get Did you get the Rona, man? Did you have it? No, not in. Alhamdulillah, yet. man. And I'm, I'm not. My wife had it. <laughs> My wife had it. I was sleeping, you know. I said, "Baby, like you got this weird sound like Schnitzel Connor. I mean, it sound like I need a bacon no more. You know what I mean? Some something happened to your throat." <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "What happened?" You know, and she's. So what do you ask? He sound right. And then that, that day she's like, man, my head's like, I feel like somebody's like punching me right in, inside of my head. And then my, my mother-in-law, she's like, down, you know? Yeah. And I said, hey, something, something going on, man. And then they both had the Rona. I didn't get it, man. 
Wow. Wow. I'm just I was hoping, like, I get it. You know what I'm saying? I'll be through. And then I had to move out. It was crazy. I'll tell you the story. I had to move from house to house because everybody kept getting it. Yeah. Then I started thinking, do I have it? Am I Am I the... That's how I, feel. I got <laughs> tested this week. Last week. Two of my barbers got it. And um, but they got it outside of the barbershop. Of course, they spread this rumor all around town that the barbershop got a big outbreak and stuff. But I got tested. I didn't have it. But I, what I'm hoping for is that they said once seventy percent of the population gets it, then the rest of us are cool. So I'm I hope all of y'all get it because I don't want the vaccine. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate that, bro. Appreciate you. But I'm gonna come back. We're gonna do another one. We'll do a live and direct. Hello. We'll talk about. Music. Inshallah. Appreciate you, brother. Zakallah man. Appreciate you. Love you, man. All right, man. Love Keep you. Keep seeing you to us. Give salam to the family. And salam to everybody out there, you know. Absolutely. And uh, keep this in your doers. Absolutely. Me too, man. Thank you. Zakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. From Samtah.